Well, hello, everybody. Many thanks for joining us again today for HydroTerra's webinar series. Another great turnout today for what's a very interesting and quite complicated topic. Today, we're learning all about microbial monitoring for groundwater remediation and enhanced site management. Our guest speaker is Dr. Sam Rosalina, who's Vice President of Microbial Insights, which is a company based in Tennessee in the US. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Bunurong people of the Kulong Nation. I also pay my respects to their elders, past and present. All right, so there's a picture of our speaker, Sam Rosalina, and a little bit about Sam and microbial insights. I said, I've had a long history of dealing with microbial insights and uh, had the pleasure of visiting them in the US, must be six or seven years ago now. Um, one of the highlights of that visit was actually going up to the Smoky Mountains National Park, which uh, is very near their office. And uh, there's a couple of pictures there on the right-hand side of that area. It's a beautiful part of the world. And, Definitely well worth visiting microbial insights and, and the uh, areas around it. So, Sam Rosalina, our speaker today. He's Vice President of Applied Innovation at Microbial Insights. He's got a Bachelor of Arts in Chemistry from Berea College and went on to complete a PhD in Analytical Chemistry at the University of Tennessee. Throughout his PhD research, Sam focused on analysis of trace level environmental toxins, including heavy metals and toxic acids. He's an expert in the detection and quantification of trace contaminants in complex mixtures and media, including the development and optimization of innovative new analytical methods and rigorous QAQC procedures. Today, Sam's going to be talking to us about analysis of uh, microbes and in particular, how, they, uh, how those analyses can be used to inform us in our studies for remediation and site management. Before we charge into his presentation, a few details. We'd love to get your questions. And in order for us to manage those effectively, uh, we need you to type them into the Q&A, which is at the top of your screen as illustrated there. Why does HydroTerra run this webinar series? There's a few reasons. We're passionate about sharing knowledge. We like to facilitate education and we like to be an industry leader. Certainly our guest speaker today and this company, Microbial Insights, have been a leader in this area for nearly 30 years. And I think we're very fortunate to have them here to help us uh, learn a bit more about how we can use this technique in our work. So a bit about the webinar sort of completed part one. So part two, microbial monitoring for groundwater remediation and enhanced site management is the topic that Sam will be going through. He'll be covering what are the tools we have available to illuminate biological potential, document petroleum and chlorinated solvent degradation and evaluate the efficacy of amendments for treating these sorts of contaminants. Then he'll be talking in detail about natural source zone depletion what is what it is and how do we assess whether the processes are occurring and finally he'll finish off with a case study in part three we will be dealing with your questions and answers so without further ado i will pass over to sam many thanks for joining us today uh, 
Hi, everyone, and thanks for uh, having me today. I want to especially thank uh, Richard and everyone else at Hydroterra for uh, allowing me to be a part of their webinar series. Um, it's a great series, and Microbial Insights is both proud to be within the webinar, but also uh, proud to be a partner of Hydroterra. So thanks to Hydroterra for all that they do. Um, I want to talk today about the importance of microbial monitoring, especially when it comes to groundwater remediation and, and enhancing conceptual site models, better understanding what's happening at a site. Uh, and so today I'll be talking about molecular biological tools or MBTs that we offer at Microbial Insights. Um, again, as, uh, as I was introduced, my name is Sam Rosalina. I'm Vice President of Applied Innovation here at Microbial Insights, which just means that I'm looking into the future and thinking about new innovative ways that we can uh, kind of help all of the industries that we serve. Some of those innovative ways are uh, thinking about some of the uh, phenomenon that we'll be talking about today, like natural source zone depletion that can be taken advantage of to really help uh, clean up a site. Uh, so I'm excited to talk to you about some of the tools that we offer at Microbial Insights. This is our 30th anniversary this year. Uh, and for those who are unfamiliar with Microbial Insights, uh, we started as a small uh, technology transfer and originally focused on looking at some of the microbial lipids, which are kind of the kind of analogous to the skin cells of the microbes and determining what what we can learn from that. Since then, we've grown in both technology and innovation. And now the majority of what we offer are DNA based analyses. So um, the the kind of key analyses that we offer are qPCR. So what qPCR does is it allows us to target specific genes, uh, segments of DNA, and say who is there. So we call that ta taxonomic genes. So what are their name tags? Which organisms are there that we, we want to see? Organisms that we're looking for. And then uh, what's in their toolbox? We call that uh, functional genes. So we're looking for taxonomic genes. Who's there? Functional genes. What tools do they have in their toolbox to better understand the potential for biodegradation at a site? Um, so we have hundreds of qPCR targets, and that can be a little bit overwhelming if you're trying to choose a la carte which targets to look for at your site. So instead, what we offer are something called quant arrays. Um, and these are arrays of qPCR targets that we can look for simultaneously. So you, instead of uh, sampling for groundwater and then selecting qPCR targets, you can instead sample that groundwater and send it to us uh, to look for a specific suite of targets related to chlorinated solvent degradation, for example, or petroleum hydrocarbon degradation. Uh, so I'll be talking about um, a few of those different Quantray platforms that we offer here uh, within this webinar. We also offer a couple different isotopic analyses. Stable isotope probing is a very powerful tool for conclusive proof of petroleum hydrocarbon biodegradation. Uh, so if you have a, a hydrocarbon site, highly recommend looking at that. Compound specific isotope analysis, similarly, uh, is very useful for chlorinated solvent sites. It also can provide conclusive evidence of degradation uh, but it can be any type of degradation. It can be biotic, uh, it can be abiotic. And so CSA is a very powerful tool for, for chlorinated solvent sites. We also have a number of passive sampling devices. Uh, probably best known is our Biotrap. It's unique to microbial insights. It's a passive sampling device that you can deploy in a pre-existing monitoring well. Uh, and it allows the native microbes to colonize that trap. So you get an understanding of which microbes are actively colonizing within, uh, within your groundwater at your site. So it's a powerful way to look at uh, the community there. And then we can run any of our molecular biological tools or MBTs off of that bio trap. So you can run uh, stable isotope probing, you can run any of our qPCR Quantray analyses, or you can look at the compound specific isotope analysis. Uh, we also have something called in situ microcosms. In situ microcosms are like a beautiful balance between a full scale pilot test and, uh, and a benchtop lab study. 
um, instead of a benchtop microcosm where you're biasing what works well in a lab or you're taking samples from the environment, and moving them to a pristine laboratory, uh, the in situ microcosm also can be deployed in a pre existing monitoring well. It's an advanced version of our bio traps, but it allows you to compare different amendments within your groundwater at your site to make sure that uh, amendment A works better over amendment B. Or for example, if you wanted to, to bio augment, you could test different bio augments and see the survivability. Now, one important thing about microbial insights is that we're strictly a lab. We don't sell any kind of products. Uh, so that allows us to be unbiased in our determination and in our data analysis. We're not trying to sell you anything on the back end. What we want to do is provide actionable data to help you decide uh, what steps to take next at a site. So if there's any takeaway uh, that I hope you bring from this talk, it's, it's when and how to use molecular biological tools. So often I think people uh, make the mistake of only thinking of strategies like monitored natural attenuation or enhanced bioremediation when it comes to monitoring for microbes in, in the groundwater and the soil at your site. And I think that's fair. I think that uh, monitoring for the microbiology for strategies like MA and enhanced bio, that's really important. It's important to know what microbes are there because a lot of your strategy revolves around that. But, uh, but I think it's also important to monitor for microbes, even if you're taking a more aggressive strategy. So for example, if you're using in-situ chemical oxidation, if you're injecting permanganate or persulfate, uh, monitoring for microbes is surprisingly important. And here's why. When you do an injection of in situ chemical oxidation, often you, you uh, destroy a lot of the contaminant mass. Uh, what's left over that's maybe still stuck on the soil or it's small fractions that the uh, oxidation didn't reach, the injection didn't reach, uh, that can back diffuse or uh, it can redissolve back into the groundwater. So now you have a lot less contaminant, but it's very dilute within the plume. And this is when bio, the microbes that are uh, natively present, can move back into town and, and polish that off. We call it biopolishing. So uh, destroying that last fragment of contaminant that's left. Uh, often people think that when you do in situ chemical oxidation or aggressive treatments like uh, thermal treatment, that it wipes out the microbial population. And though it does certainly decrease the population, what it does is it provides competitive advantage to the microbes of interest that can degrade the contaminants that are left over. So essentially you're bringing down the population of the microbes, but then after the ISCO moves through, the right microbes move back into town uh, and grow rapidly to degrade the contaminants that are left over. Similarly with thermal, and we've seen this through a number of studies uh, with uh, organizations like Cascade Environmental, um, thermal treatment does a really good job of destroying and removing high concentrations of contaminant mass at a source area, especially. And again, that high temperature does uh, destroy a lot of the microbes that are present, really decreases their population. But what we see with thermal is that you get uh, kind of this halo effect of slightly elevated temperatures around where the thermal treatment is happening. So the groundwater and soil are warm instead of hot. And what that does is it incubates the microbes of interest. And so while you're getting really aggressive uh, mass removal and destruction at the source, you're also getting enhanced bioremediation down gradient. And so the key here is that there's always microbes present at your site, uh, in your groundwater and your soil. Uh, and often, that includes indigenous microbes that are able to degrade the contaminants that you're struggling with at your site or dealing with in your strategies. Uh, and so you may as well uh, run the analysis, incorporate it into your conceptual site model and show that not only are you doing strategy A, but simultaneously, the microbes are working for you as well. So it's data that you don't want to miss out on when it comes to proving that contaminants are being degraded at your site. 
So the quandary, which I mentioned previously, is really key for doing this. It's really useful for monitoring microbes of interest. Uh, and the way that it works, and I won't go into too much detail in the science through this talk, but uh, the way that it works is, is you grab a groundwater sample or a soil sample in the same way that you would grab for a lot of different analyses, low flow pump with groundwater. Uh, and from there, what will happen is you'll, within that groundwater or soil sample, you'll also be uh, pulling out the microbes that are present in those. And we will then extract the DNA from those microbes. And that, that DNA is what we're looking for uh, to say who is there and what functional capabilities do they have? What tools in the toolbox? So we can extract that DNA. It goes onto a, a chip or an array. And within that array are many subarrays. And what that allows us to do is run qPCR analysis on lots of targets simultaneously. And so we're able to quantify these genes, uh, a number of different genes from a single target uh, at the same time. And so we can then look, as I said, we can look at functional genes, what tools are in the toolbox. We can look at taxonomic genes, uh, what name tags are present, which microbes are we looking for. And that depends on which quantray uh, that we've selected. We have a number of different quantrays. Uh, we began many years ago with quantray chlor, which is specific to sites uh, with chlorinated solvent impacts. Uh, we have the quantray petro for petroleum hydrocarbon sites. Shortly after, we introduced the Quantray MIC, which is uh, useful for, for showing that the potential for microbiologically influenced corrosion. In this case, we're, you know, we're looking for bad microbes that can cause problems, whereas for all of our other Quantrays, we're looking for good microbes that can help us remediate. Uh, and then now we have two newer versions of the Quantray. We have the Quantray NSCD for natural source zone depletion, and I'll be talking about this in, in depth today. Uh, and we have the Quantry BGC, which is for biogeochemical analysis. So uh, a strong way of um, enhancing the biogeochemical data that you might be already uh, grabbing at your site. So briefly, what does this look like? I'm going to show you a couple of quick examples. Uh, the Quantry Petro is one of our quantrays and it includes over 20 different gene targets related to uh, petroleum hydrocarbon biodegradation. So when we look at the results of just a subsection of those gene targets, we can see uh, some of the gene targets here along the x-axis, and you don't necessarily have to know what they are, uh, but our reports will describe in depth what these gene targets are, what they're related to. Along the y-axis, we have our quantification, and this is really key and why the quantray is important, is it gives you these values that you can use as uh, key performance indicators or to better understand how to enhance the bio at a site. Um, and so on the, on the left, again, are our concentrations, our cells per milliliter. The concentrations and the quantification is key to apply because it provides things like percentile rankings. So up here you can see uh, that the potential for anaerobic degradation of polyaromatic hydrocarbons is in the top 90th percentile at, at one of these wells. And so uh, the quantification part is, is really key to understanding what's happening at the site. So this is just a subsection of our Quantray Petro. It includes targets related to these PAH biodegradation. On the left-hand side, we've grouped together aerobic PAH degradation, functional genes related to aerobic PAH degradation. And on the right-hand side, uh, we've incorporated functional genes related to anaerobic PAH degradation. And so if you look at the data, we can look at the light gray well, 17D, is a background well. It's unimpacted by any of the hydrocarbons at this site, so no BTECs, no PAHs. And we do see that there are no functional gene targets related to PAH degradation that were detected at this well, which makes sense because there's no impact. Our upgradient well near the source is this darker blue, 7C. For our upgrading well, we see a good potential for aerobic PAH degradation, while our downgradient well, 44, this light blue, has a really high potential for uh, anaerobic PAH degradation. So downgradient 
much better chance of moving anaerobic, allowing uh, these PAH degraders to take effect. Another subsection of this data, and this is from the same site, uh, are BTEX degraders. So aerobic BTEX degradation on the left-hand side, anaerobic on the right-hand side. Again, you can see anaerobic potential down gradient is pretty high for BTEX, uh, while up gradient aerobic is, uh, is the better potential. Similarly, we have the Quantre Chlor, which is related to chlorinated solvent sites. This includes over 29 different gene targets uh, specific to chlorinated solvent biodegradation. And it looks pretty similar. Uh, down here on the bottom, we have a number of different gene targets. Functional genes, the tools in the toolbox, like vinyl chloride reductase. Uh, we also have a number of taxonomic genes, so the name tags of the organisms we're looking for. One you may recognize is Dehalicocoides, or DHC. This organism is really good at degrading PCE all the way down to harmless ethene, and it can do that on its own. But there's a number of different degraders present. And again, those percentile rankings uh, come into play. What percentile compared to sites around the world are these numbers? Are they high or are they low? So this is a, a, a two-time point analysis at the same location at a site. The blue is the baseline, so pre-injection, and the red is a post-injection. And just from these two time points, uh, a lot of questions were answered at the site, including uh, did the injection work? First of all, is an electron donor injection needed with the pre-injection? And then after the injection, showing that not only did it work, but it increased some of these targets to the top 98th percentile compared to sites around the world. Both of these examples uh, were actually utilized to, um, to obtain an m &A ruling uh, by a regulatory body. So both of these moved towards monitored natural attenuation. Again, that may not always be the strategy, um, but it is important to note that this data is really key for showing the potential for complete biodegradation at a site. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk briefly about natural source zone depletion. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term, uh, natural source zone depletion is uh, a relatively new concept. It's a phenomenon uh, that scientists have noted uh, results in pretty rapid decrease of source zone LNAPL. Um, so liquid, uh, light non-aqueous phase liquids. Uh, and so for a long time, we knew that anaerobic biodegradation of uh, constituents of petroleum hydrocarbons could be degraded biologically. Um, and so we knew that that was occurring, uh, but it wasn't until more recently that this natural source zone depletion came into light. It's a very complex phenomenon. And just to kind of highlight how complex it is, this is a uh, uh, a figure from a LARI paper from 2019, and it includes a lot of different components of what could and should be modeled if, uh, if there were models for natural source zone depletion. So a lot of those are physical processes like volatilization and dilution, dissolution. Um, a lot of them are microbial processes. Uh, some of them are things like uh, microbial byproducts like biofilms or biosurfactants. Uh, and then there's a lot of chemical, uh, chemical portion to this. So there's a lot of play between the chemistry, the geochemistry, the biochemistry, the biology, and of course the physical properties. So it's a very complex uh, phenomenon that we're still learning a lot about. So the easiest way to kind of break it down in terms of the biological portion uh, is what we've found is this GARG paper, which gives an overview of natural source zone depletion from 2017. It kind of breaks natural source zone depletion into segments uh, in terms of depth within the soil. And so you'll see that where the LNAPL exists, there's saturated LNAPL and there's unsaturated LNAPL zone, the unsaturated zone. Within that, we can expect to see things like methanogens, um, fermenters. These fermenters break down the L-napple and produce uh, products that the methanogens can then convert to methane. We can look for things like biosurfactant production. This is a, a functional capability that a number of organisms have to produce essentially a, a detergent, and that detergent 
can pull some of the petroleum hydrocarbons out of the soil pores uh, and into the water. So it makes the degradation more rapid. And it also incorporates some of the physical process. Uh, we also have looking into, of course, like the redox situation of the site, what kind of reducing conditions are present. And then we have kind of up near the surface methanotrophs in the aerobic portion of the site. Methanotrophs are able to take the methane that the methanogens produce, turn it into CO2. So the presence of methanotrophs is a pretty clear indicator, uh, along with the com combination of uh, methanogens and fermenters that NSED is likely taking place at a site. So breaking it down in this way is, is helpful. Um, but then the question is, why is this important? Why do we necessarily care about NSCD or monitoring NSCD? Um, and the reason is this, is that through uh, a, a large overview or um, analysis of lots of different sites undergoing NSCD, GARG was able to see relatively high rates of uh, source removal under natural conditions. Uh, so for example, over you know, 2,100 to 7,700 gallons per acre per year, or but that comes through about 20,000 to 72,000 liters per hectare per year. So it's not uh, a number that's worth turning your back on. It's worth investigating more. If there's a potential that this is happening at your site, these are rates that are, that are seriously helpful in terms of remediation timelines, cleaning up the site. So then the next question, of course, how do we get there? How do we uh, move towards natural source zone depletion or see if it's present at our site? And just like anything, uh, if we're trying to get from point A to point B, we want to draw a map. So if you were to ask me to draw you a map to get from Melbourne to Adelaide, and I drew this map, uh, this would not be a helpful map. It doesn't give much context. Uh, you, you don't know even which direction is north versus south. Um, you don't know if there are any barriers in the way. And most importantly, it provides no context for how to get from point A to point B. There's no bus routes, there's no train schedules, there's no highways uh, or even, um, you know, city blocks. And so this is not a very helpful map. Even if I were to throw in more context, like where is that in relation to Sydney? This is not a useful map. And similarly, this is analogous to just looking at the chemical and geochemical parameters. So right now for natural source zone depletion, there are some in-depth and very technical ways to measure natural source zone depletion once you know it's occurring already. But the easiest way to identify uh, if it's occurring currently is looking at the chemical and geochemical parameters. And while these are very important, they don't give you much context. So we can look at things like, we know that fermenters produce some of these targets and we know that methanogens produce this, but we don't know how they all interact. And so this is why incorporating molecular biological tools like the Quantray NSCD is really important. It's because it provides much more context for how these chemical and geochemical parameters interact. And so now we have, you know, we have those, uh, those streets, we have one-way streets and we have highways. We know how all of these targets interact. And so these gold boxes are gene targets that are incorporated in the Quantray NSCD. And by utilizing the Quantray NSCD alongside our other lines of evidence, like our chemical and our geochemical, we're able to much better understand what's happening at the site. And so here we can see things like fermenters, which can degrade the L-napple directly and produce all of these different byproducts like alcohol, formate, hydrogen, volatile fatty acids. You don't necessarily need to know all of the biochemistry, but as long as you understand how these things connect, it's very useful because now we can see if there's fermenters and they're doing their job well, then we have methanogens, which are able to convert a lot of these products into methane. If we have me uh, methane, we likely have methanotrophs, which are able to use uh, lots of different electron acceptors to turn methane into alcohols, which can then be converted into CO2. Uh, 
Uh, and so all of these play important roles within the NSCD uh, microbiome. We also have, as I mentioned, the biosurfactant production. This would be a functional gene, uh, a tool in a toolbox. The biosurfactant production, like I mentioned, is able to pull uh, these petroleum hydrocarbons out of the soil pores and dissolve them uh, into the groundwater. And so also utilizing the Quantrae Petro in conjunction with Quantrae NSCD is very useful because now there are gene targets that can go after the dissolved petroleum hydrocarbons that are in the groundwater thanks to the biosurfactant production of some of these other microorganisms. So stringing these analyses together uh, and monitoring the microbes at a site can really add to your overall understanding of what's happening at the site and can add to whatever strategy that you're using. So as an example of that, this is a site where there was uh, El Napal source area, quite a bit left as you'll see, and then uh, the utilization of Quantre Petro and Quantre NSCD were incorporated into uh, this site management uh, early on, uh, which ended up saving quite a bit of money over time. So looking at some of the basic parameters, the chemistry um, and some of the geochemical parameters, we're looking at BTEX concentrations in the source area, uh, very high, so as high as 60 milligrams per liter. As we move down gradient, that decreases uh, below detection limit in some locations or around one milligram per liter. But even uh, in the mid plume, we're seeing relatively high concentrations of BTEX, five to 10 milligrams per liter. If we look at the methane, we see that methane is being produced somewhere around the source area. Uh, we see no methane in our background well, as can be expected. Um, and we see a little bit produced kind of on the outskirts of the plume as well. So without the Quantre data, this would be uh, pretty much all that we had to go off of. But instead we can turn to some of the Quantre data and understand what are the, what are the different potentials for biodegradation at this site. So let's start with some of the Quantre Petro targets. These are a number of different gene targets related to aerobic BTEX degradation. So the degradation of benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, xylenes um, under aerobic conditions. Uh, and we see within the source area, less potential for aerobic degradation, uh, but down gradient where we would expect it to be more aerobic, we see quite a bit of potential for aerobic degradation of BTEX compounds at this site. This is good to know. It means that likely degraders are already degrading some of these BTEX compounds. And it may also be why our concentrations dip to uh, below detection limit in some locations near the outskirts of the plume. Now, here's where a background well comes into play and is really important for microbial monitoring. Some genes, uh, are a little bit more ubiquitous than others. And so we do see aerobic BTEX degrading genes present outside of the plume. And that gives us context for the ones that are detected inside of the plume. So we can say that these locations have aerobic BTEX degradation potential similar to uh, background. And so having that added context is key. You might also ask, why do we see high concentrations of aerobic BTEX degradation in the source area where we would expect it to be anaerobic. Oftentimes what we'll see are microaerophilic uh, heterogeneities. In other words, our soil and our groundwater is not as homogeneous as we like to portray in some of our pictures like this, right? Um, there can be aerobic pockets uh, within that soil. And so we might see the potential for aerobic degradation. Or it could also be that there are organisms that are present that have these tools in their toolbox and are ready to use them should the site switch to aerobic. Um, so important to keep in mind some of that context as well. Now let's look at anaerobic text degradation. This is the degradation of toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylenes under anaerobic conditions. This is a gene BSSA specific to this function. It's a tool in a toolbox. In the background well, we don't see any of this gene target, um, but we do see relatively high concentrations in the source area. 
uh, medium concentrations in some of the down gradient source area and in the middle of the plume. We don't really see any potential for anaerobic text degradation along the outskirts of the plume, which makes sense because we know that they're relatively aerobic. So then let's start looking at some of the NSCD targets, the natural source zone depletion targets. We know that at the base of that structure were fermenters. The fermenters are really key uh, for producing the byproducts that are then utilized by the methanogens and then the methanotrophs. They're the ones that kickstart the whole process of natural source zone depletion by fermenting the l napple present at the site. And sure enough, at the source zone, what we see are high concentrations of fermenters, which is what we would hope to see for NSCD. As we move down gradient, we see mid-range concentrations of fermenters, but again, they're about the same as our background concentrations. Now, what about methanogens? Methanogens are also relatively high near the source area. Down gradient, we see on the outskirts of the plume, lower concentrations, but there's still methanogens present. And this actually matches up well with our methane map. Where did we see methane concentrations high, medium, and low? Last, we wanna look at things like our biosurfactant genes. These are gene targets related to that detergent production that some microbes can do. And this is again, useful for pulling the petroleum hydrocarbons out of the soil into the groundwater for more rapid degradation. Here we also see some uh, concentrations, mid-range concentrations of biosurfactant producing genes here at the site, uh, both in the source area and some locations down gradient, but mostly seen at the source area where we would expect an SCD to be taking place. So overall at the site, uh, between the two different analyses, single time point, but trended down gradient uh, what we saw was a good genetic potential for aerobic BTEX degradation throughout the plume, anaerobic TEX degradation in the source area of the plume, but we also see a good potential for natural source zone depletion based on some of just a, a few number of these NSCD targets. Uh, again, the NSCD, the Quantra NSCD incorporates over 20 different gene targets related to natural source zone depletion, but uh, just due to time, we didn't have a chance to show you all of those targets. But the key here is that it's likely occurring at the site. So the site manager was then able to move to a more technical strategy to monitor the natural source zone depletion and actually monitor some of those rates. Now, I want to say that we have, uh, we have one client that has a very large portfolio of petroleum hydrocarbon sites. And what they found by using our MBTs is that by uh, performing about, we'll put it in uh, Australian dollars, but by performing about 12,000 Australian dollars worth of microbial monitoring up front uh, or throughout the process, that they were able to save overall about 500,000 to 800,000 Australian dollars um, over the course of the project. And that's because they're able to understand what's happening at the site better, incorporate that biodegradation alongside their other strategies, and avoid switching strategies when they don't need to based on the data uh, that we provide. So what does the Quantray report look like? This is a portion of that report. Uh, some of the gene targets on the left, the sample names and the concentration. This was a soil sample. So this is cells per gram instead of cells per milliliter. Um, but then the question is, what does this mean? How do I know what this data actually tells me? Is this high or is this low? So also within those reports, we provide heat maps to give you a better context of what those concentrations are in reference to other sites around the world. Are these high concentrations or are they low? Now, the way that we're able to provide those heat maps and also those percentile rankings that I mentioned earlier is our Microbial Insights database. So this is a database that's over 25 years old. It incorporates over 100,000 field samples from around the world, literally from all seven continents. We just uh, recently got samples from Antarctica. And so we're, we were very uh, much looking forward to being able to say all seven continents. Uh, and so through our qPCR database, we're able to provide much more context for that data. It allows you to look at your data and say, compared to sites around the world, 
Is this high? Is this medium low? Do I need to do something to enhance these numbers or should we leave it as is? Is this good for MNA? Is this good for uh, post in situ chemical oxidation? Um, and so by having this database, we're able to give you much more than just a number on a piece of paper. So some key things that we recommend in terms of using microbial uh, monitoring and data. We don't expect you to be a microbiologist or to have microbiologists on your team. Um, and so we always recommend to treat MI, microbial insights, as your microbiologist. You can ask us questions, uh, talk through a site with us. Uh, we are very customer service oriented, as is Hydroterra, our Australian partner. Um, we also recommend generating actionable data, so thinking about what questions you want answered at the site, and then working with us to figure out the tools that are best uh, for answering those questions. Um, and then using the database to add context is really key. So using that database, incorporating your own, uh, we also allow clients to upload their own information, like uh, chemistry, geochemistry at a site to kind of better hone in uh, usefulness within that database. But even just the microbial data alone, using the database actually uh, provides quite a bit more context for you. And then the last but not least, as you saw throughout this presentation, trending the data is really key. You want to look at background concentrations. You want to look at concentrations either over time or moving down gradient, different portions of the plume. Trending the data is really necessary uh, because it gives you much more information and, and relative comparisons to better understand what's happening at the site. And again, I want to stress that, as I mentioned before, we don't sell any products. Uh, we're strictly a laboratory, so that allows us to be unbiased in our interpretation of the data. Um, and so there's no fear of us trying to sell you uh, a culture or a product in order to, uh, to keep you. Um, we have locations all around the world. As you probably know, uh, we have a location in Adelaide, Australia, and so receiving samples is very easy for us. And then last but not least, of course, are our partners, Hydroterra, which we're very thankful for, uh, both again in uh, allowing us to be part of their great webinar series, but also for being uh, fantastic partners uh, in Australia, our boots on the ground in Australia. If you have questions about um, what we offer, I recommend that you reach out to Richard or anyone else at Hydroterra. Um, and if you want to reach out to us directly, you can email us at info at microbe.com. But our Hydroterra partners are, are really key for our Australia uh, customers, and um, they can direct you to us if they need to, but they're always there to answer your questions. So again, I want to thank all of you for being here today. I want you to take away the fact that microbial monitoring is really useful no matter what your strategy is, truly. Uh, there's always microbes present. And if they're degrading the contaminants alongside your strategy, it's worth knowing that. Um, and again, I want to thank you, Richard, and everyone else at Hydroterra for setting this up. Very happy to be able to do this. Thank goodness for technology that allows me to present in Australia um, while being asleep in my bed. So thanks uh, for allowing me to pre-record this and present to all of you today. Uh, again, reach out if you have any questions, and uh, thanks again. So I'm, all, I'm sure you'll all agree that that was a very comprehensive presentation and it's truly amazing how advanced we've become in terms of being able to assess and predict remediation. I had a few sort of personal takeaways that I've taken out of this presentation. Firstly, there's always microbes present. And it's kind of nice to know that they are there and they seem to be able to, in many cases, lead to action and sometimes we need to stimulate them, but uh, typically they are present. Um, secondly, the tools we have seen today provide valuable insights into the efficacy of those microbial populations for assisting with remediation. So not only these days do we know that they're there, but with the ability to sort of characterize those genes that actually do the work, uh, we, we know a lot more about, a lot more certainty that they can actually do the job we need them to do. 
Uh, it's really important to understand, I think, that in situ remediation does occur and sometimes the rates of that remediation are significant without us doing much at all. So getting these sort of metrics early in the process, like actually in the assessment process, allows you to be better informed about that before you commit to you know, large scale remediation works. Because in some instances, it may not be worth doing much remediation at all, if you know that uh, you're getting significant degradation anyway. So very important to think about that. These assessment technologies that Sam's gone through today do pro provide predictive indicators of biodegradation of chlorinated solvents, petroleum, hydrocarbons, and microbial corrosion. And so they're definitely worth keeping in the back of your mind for assisting your clients with their sites. And if you're a site owner, uh, something that you would be hoping that you're being advised on to help you assess what level of cleanup that you need to do. Finally, monitored zone, source zone depletion is becoming more commonly discussed. Um, and these sort of indicators really do provide us with a lot more understanding of all the factors affecting the rate of that depletion and whether or not we can have certainty that it is actually occurring. So they were my take aims. Without further ado, I think let's move over to Q&A and we've got quite a few early bird questions which we will go through now. Thank you very much. Well, we've had several early bird questions come in today, well, over the last week, and many thanks for those. I'm going to move to looking at those now, and um, we'll read those out. I've spoken with Sam um, earlier today to get his input into these questions and uh, I will do my best to answer your questions now. So question number one, are there any tools for real-time dissolved oxygen monitoring in groundwater bores? Well, there are many, and certainly that's a core part of Hydroterra's business, and we offer them both for sale and rental, and you can have them connected up for telemetry purposes, uh, or you can have them with data logging devices. Um, there's a range of different types. Uh, often we use optical DO sensors these days because they are uh, more reliable in the long term, um, uh, certainly. But uh, feel free to give us a call so uh, we can help you out there. Next question. Environmental health risk assessment brackets microbial of leachate, microbes in leachate. So we had a little bit of trouble understanding the emphasis here, and in the end we concluded that um, the question related to, uh, is it possible to track the, or use the microbial analyses that microbial insights have to evaluate the health risks of microbes? And the short answer is yes, um, they certainly do that for um, water quality, where you're looking at drinking water quality, for example, and trying to work out what the source of the microbial impact um, that's been identified in that drinking water, for example. So in the context where you're looking for, has there been an impact to say a beneficial use of drinking water from leachate, you can certainly use the analyses, the analytical techniques that microbial insight have to help you trace what the source of that microbial impact is. I think I've covered everything that Sam said on that. Question three. Any suggestions where this data or other microbial site data would be indicative of increased soil carbon? Well, this was a really interesting question. And uh, the, the answer to that is yes. There's a lot 
that can be done with this sort of data. Um, so the first part of it is to say that research has shown that um, if you look at the ratio of microbes to fungi, um, that's an important thing to know about, right? So if that ratio gets out of kilter, um, that affects how much soil carbon is actually there. So there's a direct relationship between soil microbial activity and soil carbon and the microbes and fungi have an incredibly important part to play in that. Um, so understanding that ratio is an important indicator of whether or not you're actually getting sequestration processes occurring. Um, the second part of this is that uh, microbial insights do have um, really good ways of identifying whether certain specific activities and microbial reactions are actually happening in the soil. So they can also map those processes. And they have a name for that. Um, they call that next generation sequencing. Um, but uh, I guess the short answer is yes. And uh, it would be a good thing to reach out to Microbial Insights for further information on that. Question number four. How can computer vision or technology be helpful in microbial monitoring? So we took this question to be focused on uh, what an additional data analysis can be undertaken on the primary data that's collected by microbial insights. So keep in mind the data that microbial insights collects is all kept on a database that, that they retain and they sort of quarantine your specific data in there. Um, and that data is, is largely about those sorts of parameters that we've looked at today in the webinar. What what they have indicated that and what is very useful is to get additional site specific data from the consultants doing the work. Um, some of those site specific contaminant concentrations and other indicators of those sort of secondary indicators of whether or not biological activity are occurring. occurring. So bringing those two data sets together and doing some analysis in the um, database that Microbial Insights have does sound really valuable. Um, that's probably one of the main ones. They've also been um, very effective at combining some of these data sets together to create spatial plots which allow you to identify more clearly by combining, you know, more site specific data with theirs to, to really identify what areas of the site, those pockets that would benefit most from some specific augmentation with some kind of additive. And I think that's really important to know. All right, next question. Any tools to measure cell activity? Therefore, 10 cells running at 100% or 100 cells running at 10%. This might help formulate what nutrients are required. Look, the analyses that Microbial Insights do, they have a very specific way of of achieving what I think this question's getting at, which is, will the site benefit from additives? And the key uh, um, analysis that um, is most beneficial, I have written down here, in situ microcosms, and these can be deployed in pre-existing monitoring wells and they allow 
comparison between different wells to allow us to assess even within the single site which parts of the site would benefit most from that formulation. So getting back to the emphasis of the question, um, are the cells running at 100% or running at 10%? That's exactly how you would do it using their technology. So <clears throat> sounds like a really practical approach to put to it before you start making recommendations on adding amendments is to actually do those studies. Um, microbes that really do the work. Final question. How does the transmission of data or information? How is that managed from the remote location? Well, the short answer is microbial insights collect samples, whether they're on their um, customized sampling devices or whether they're just traditional samples of water and soil. So they take them back to, in the case of Australia, back to Adelaide um, for analysis. Um, and they don't specifically have any remote monitoring technology. However, um, what HydroTerra does is a lot of that sort of work, right? Collecting remote data and transmitting that data back. Um, and that data can be combined with the outputs from microbial insights. And I think that's where the key here really is, is uh, if you can have that site specific sort of time series data, providing um, indicators of that biological activity uh, combined with the actual hard data from microbial insights on what genes are present and uh, how they can be stimulated. Uh, I think that leads to a really powerful way to be able to advise your clients on how to improve their in situ remediation. Now that's the end of the early bird questions today. Um, unfortunately, due to some logistical challenges today, I'm not going to be able to field the other questions that have been raised during the Q&A during the webinar. Uh, apologies for that, but I've had a flight change which has disrupted my availability for that. So um, I would really like to thank you all for attending today and any of the questions that you have raised today in the webinar, we will uh, send emails out to uh, the recipients of this webinar. Um, so you will uh, get some answers to those in writing. Uh, but many thanks for attending the webinar today and really appreciate uh, Sam's uh, involvement in this one and uh, also your own. Many thanks. Cheers for now.